Hi everyone, welcome to the Proclaim Peace podcast, where we talk about what the restored gospel teaches us about how we can become better peacemakers. I'm Jennifer Thomas, and as always, I'm happy to be here with my co-host, Patrick Mason. How are you today, Patrick? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. Good. Well, we, we hope that, uh, that this podcast is inspiring people to think about the Book of Mormon as a tool that they can use uh, to become better peacemakers, and, and also that they're reading the Book of Mormon with fresh perspective. I know definitely that's been my journey. Uh, I, I think that's been true for you as well. Yeah, Jen. absolutely. <laughs> New things popping up around every corner. Yeah, that this, uh, this book has more to tell us about peace even than, than we may have imagined or anticipated. And, and I don't think this should necessarily be surprising to us. I mean, peace is one of the fruits of the Spirit. Uh, and, and of course, um, you know, the, the, the Book of Mormon is, is just, uh, it is the great witness of Christ and, and teaches us all these things. But, but it's just uh, really striking to me to see how, uh, how, how peace comes and goes. It's, it's, it's so tied up into these histories of individuals and families that we read about in the book. Yeah, so because of this, we've been lingering a lot in um, both Second Nephi and Jacob because we feel like we don't have any need to rush. Um, we're just trying to go where the lessons take us. And so we are still in those chapters today. And this conversation for us is an example of two things. First, proof that it is worth lingering over scripture. Um, it's also important that we read it in conjunction with our neighbors and friends and, and be prepared to talk about things on a schedule. But but we also want to encourage you to linger. Um, the second thing we want to invite you to realize is how much richness can be added when we dialogue about the scriptures with people who are seeking peace in their lives using different frameworks and perspectives, that they're bringing their disciplines and their knowledge to this conversation. Um, because of her training, our guest today saw things in scripture that Patrick and I had completely missed. And we believe that she has a great deal of comfort to offer all of us together as we do the work of raising new generations prepared to create peace. We know that we're bringing children up in a world that is particularly fractured right now. And sometimes it is of um, great comfort to us to find new knowledge in the scripture that helps us understand how we can guide towards people towards peace. We put a lot of consideration and care into how we raise our own children. And in a covenant community, we also share the responsibility for nurturing and protecting other people's children, young people within our wards and stakes. We all agree that we want to do our best for them. We want them to have lives that are characterized by righteousness, peace, prosperity, and hope. But what happens when that outcome is beyond our control? And we would propose at the very beginning of this conversation that in spite of what we tell ourselves and want to believe, our children's lived experiences are always pretty much mostly beyond our control. So how can we as a people um, filled with hope come to trust that there are divine systems in place that will guide our children to a place of greater peace? Yeah, I think that that's so well put because we we've we've spent so much time talking about the, the struggles and challenges and conflicts that are uh, evident within that first family that we read about within the Book of Mormon, yeah. Lehi and Sariah's family. And normally I've, I've read the Book of Mormon really focusing on on the conflict between Laman and Lemuel and, and Nephi. Right. That, that That's so much of, of what we focus on. But but we have to remember that there were there were other children as well who, who came on and, yeah. and, 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 and we get these two sons, especially born in the wilderness, Jacob and, and Joseph, and they had a very different upbringing than their older brothers who had been raised in, it seems like, a certain level of wealth and, and comfort uh, with, within Jerusalem. And so so they had the same parents. Uh, as as their older brothers, but very different experiences. I, I, I think it's safe to say certain traumas uh, that they experienced uh, just by virtue of, of being born in the in the hardship that they had in the wilderness, and and that trauma bears out in their adulthood as well. It it, it doesn't just end, and and so so some of the the most beloved scriptures that, that we have, you know, take for instance Second Nephi chapter two. This is Lehi speaking to his son Jacob, and it's very much in the context of thinking about Jacob's experience being somebody who was who was born in the wilderness and 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 born into into struggle. And so I think uh, uh, I think it's really useful to to think about these passages as the words of not only a prophet but also a father to a child uh, who has suffered. Um, 
So the message we hope to leave with you today is really simple, that we believe, both Patrick and I and our guests, that God foresaw the struggle. He sees all of our struggle. He foresees, foresees the possibility of our suffering, and he built us to withstand that. We're built physically, mentally, and spiritually to be able to reset. Um, and he also additionally has offered us a savior. So for parents who worry about their children, which is basically all of us, for people who worry about the future of humanity, which is basically all of us, <laughs> Jacob can provide a really gleaming example for us about how trauma and struggle can be transformed into peace and to a powerful witness of God and how uh, of, and of his love and of the atonement of his son. So today we're joined by Annie Bentley Wattis, who will be leading us through this discussion. Annie grew up in Logan, Utah, not too far from where Patrick is now. Yeah, um, Logan. And she, she graduated <laughs> with, uh, with an English degree from Utah State University. Also, Go USU. Shout out to Patrick. <laughs> um, over a decade later, after putting in some dedicated time as a mother, she returned to grad school for, to get both a master's and a PhD in human development from Tufts University. She now has more than 20 years of experience in developmental society, science, focusing on development in challenging circumstances, infant parent mental health, and home visiting interventions. She's led programs, researched early development at Tufts University, and has consulted globally on early child de development in um, on kids in very difficult situations. She's also served as on the faculty at Southern Virginia University and completed a postdoctoral appointment at Global Ties for Children and at NYU Abu Dhabi where she worked on a project with one of my favorite organizations in the world, Sesame Workshop, and the International Rescue Committee um, that was working with refugees. Annie has recently brought all of that amazing experience to MWEG, where she is the Director of Child and Family Advocacy and the Director of Strategy. And you're gonna see today how she um, melds beautifully an understanding of the scientific um, basis of how we develop and learn with an understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ. All of her work has been rooted in love of family, both her family of origin and the one she's created with her husband, Greg. Together, they have three grown children and two, son, two sons-in-law and two granddaughters. And we are so excited to have her with us today. Annie, welcome. We want to prime this conversation by asking you the question we ask all our guests, which is how do you define peace? Uh, it's such a good question. And I think for a lot of years, I went to this particular moment right after I graduated from high school and I was relieved of all the pressures and I had the best nap I'd have in years. <laughs> uh, and that felt peaceful and peace to me. I can, sp I can identify the very spot in Hillsborough, New, New Hampshire. Um, but as I have learned and grown, I've realized that peace is much more complex and has kind of a more elusive definition. Um, and I think for me, I draw a lot from some of my studies in, in human development and think about peace being a zone, um, kind of a, a zone of, of sustainable connection and growth and meaning, um, ultimately connection to God, but on kind of a pragmatic level also to a person, to music, to nature. Um, peace feels like a flowing adjustment to any of those toward kind of an e inner equilibrium. Oh, that's fascinating. Uh, I, I love that definition and I love that you think about it as, as this kind of zone, almost as a kind of a space or a place uh, to be in rather than maybe like a, a state of being or a destination or something like that. And, and you mentioned the word uh, development. And, and it seems that, that that could be really useful to, to think about Jacob and his ministry, this kind of space that, that he finds himself in. So, um, so I wonder if you could talk more based on your work, based on all of your expertise in terms of what kinds of environments or zones or spaces might be particularly conducive uh, to the peace, especially of children, uh, as as they develop? Yeah, um, you know, this really sort of screamed out at me as I was reading about Jacob, and in particular, the fact that he was a child of the wilderness. And mm. um, in developmental theory, most people have heard of the theory of attachment, and attachment means that ideally in a young person's life, there's a healthy blend of predictable safety and also exploration of nurture and challenge. And so to be securely attached ideally is when those experiences of safety and nurture and exploration and challenge are scaffolded by parents. Um, and those parents kind of serve as both a secure base to explore from 
and also a safe haven, haven to return to in times of stress. And so I often think about like a toddler at the park and they're very drawn to explore and try out that new piece of equipment and, and maybe the one that's just a little bit harder than they should be on. Um, but also running back or looking back to get safety and comfort from that secure base parent. And so hopefully most of the time there's that kind of special adult that serves as that secure base and it adds up over a number of months and years. And then of course this pattern over and over again reinforces a particular and very personal map about the world. And so for instance, when I am distressed and if I'm a young baby or a child growing up, is there someone to help me regulate? Or if I'm in danger, do I have someone who will get close and protect me? Um, do I have the amount of freedom I need to learn and experience things that prepare me to thrive? Do I have enough challenge um, to kind of create growth and an accurate understanding of the world? And so all these answers kind of form this personal map um, that the theory calls an internal, internal working model of the world. And that includes relationships of what we can expect from our environment and people within it. And so our systems are wonderfully de designed to adapt to our circumstances in order to help us survive. And so that became especially um, salient as I was thinking about Jacob um, being born in the wilderness and wondering sort of the circumstances that he, that he experienced as a young child. So Annie, I love this. And it's clear from the way you've explained this, why you think of pieces as a zone, because everything that you've sort of described for me isn't, um, or isn't just how children feel in a moment, but it's creating a world in which they move that is conducive to them feeling sort of at peace and having that equilibrium that you talked about. So what happens though, when there isn't enough safety predictability, you know, when there isn't, a, isn't, or at least aren't people that can create that zone and build it into a childhood when children don't get strong scaffolding or a perfect launch. Um, how can we see that manifest itself in the view of the world, their view of the world? Right. So as I said, the system is so beautiful in that it adapts. So if, you know, as a child learns and grows, it seems like there might be some things that might be dangers or maybe there are, isn't enough, um, protection, then the child will develop kind of some compensating uh, elements that might be activated to protect the child's survival. And that occurs down to the brain synapses. So our brain is amazing that it sort of reconstitutes according to like the experience in the world and what is needed. Um, and so again, for that child in the playground example, you know, maybe the safety of the situation limits exploration. And so the parent has to keep the child a little safer, or maybe the stresses on the parent limit their ability to serve as a secure base. And so this affects their internal working model or their, their kind of working version of the world. Um, and so that's one way that, that it shows up. And again, it, it might be that the world around the child is, is quite complex and even very stressed, but often the parent in that relationship can serve, can serve as a buffer um, and, and help the child regulate. In, in one research project that I worked on in the Middle East, we worked with a lot of Syrian refugee families. And it was really interesting because we had in those families, both children who were born in Syria, um, had experienced a stable home life uh, and had grown to a certain point, And then the, the family had to take flight. And then there were other children in the family, in the other children in those families in the refugee camps who were born after that secure and kind of predictable, stable time. And you would think maybe, you know, going into it, I sort of wondered if it was harder on the kids who could remember what it was like and, and sort of struggled with that difference. But in actuality, it was the children who were born in that wilderness, who were born kind of with that instability who really were challenged. And it's because, um, you know, those children who remember home and that sense of stability had a hope that that could return. But the children who were born um, in those really hard circumstances had nothing to compare it to and had established sort of in their hearts and minds that this is the way things are, that, um, you know, food may not always be available when needed, that um, that their safety and their surroundings might be um, 
you know, more unstable. And so they had adjusted, they had adapted some coping things that were totally appropriate for their circumstance, but not ideal, um, probably for um, most children, as you might guess. So you had some fantastic insights about how this relates to Jacob, and we would love to have you share them with our listeners. Yeah, so I was thinking about Jacob, born in the wilderness, um, seems to be someone who adapted to those circumstances with a kind of maybe anxiousness. Um, and I think of Lehi and Soraya, they're these wonderful, goodly parents um, in hard circumstances. And so Jacob was born, um, like some of the families that I was acquainted with, um, in a wilderness, in basically in flight, um, without any knowledge of when it was going to end. And so I just think about that baby, you know, um, growing in the arms of his mom and um, sort of witnessing some of the ups and downs and, and really big trials and even, um, you know, quite a bit, probably trauma, watching his brothers go at it. And so um, he witnessed a lot of upheavals and conflict. Um, and I was, as I was reading Lehi's blessing to Jacob, um, I noticed um, some some clues that, that gave me kind of some insight into um, maybe some of these ways that Jacob um, might have compensated in his development um, as a child of the wilderness. Um, and I will just add, I, I, I found such um, confirmation as the truths of the Book of Mormon when I read this entirely kind of aligned behavior with, with the experience that I know of from developmental science. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, Jacob, you know, he had, you probably remember this is back in um, second Nephi when, when Lehi gives the blessings to his son, he starts out with Laman and Lemuel and he gives them a lot of caution and warning, awake and arise. Um, and then he turns to Jacob and he starts by saying, um, Thou art my firstborn in the days of my tribulation in the wilderness, and behold, in thy childhood thou hast suffered afflictions and much sorrow because of the rudeness of thy brethren. And then he goes on to kind of issue these um, very comforting, um, reassuring, confidence-building blessings on his son's head. Um, and I think as parents, we can understand where he was coming from in feeling like, this has not been easy for you, and I want to bless you with, um, with some reassurances. And I jotted down a couple. He was he kind of said, um, "I know thou art redeemed." Um, he talked to him about redemption. He talked about um, men are that they might have joy. And to me, the undercurrent is Jacob is a son who's maybe experiencing some anxiousness and has sort of come up wondering um, where his safety is. And Lehi is wanting to connect him with uh, that resource that maybe he wasn't able to give and wanted to um, in blessing him with that, uh, both the knowledge of the Savior and also of his uh, divine connection to God. I think that's so interesting. And yeah, I, I think any good, careful reader of, of these first few books of, of the Book of Mormon will recognize there is a shift in tone and personality when we go from Nephi to, to Jacob, right? These are these are two different characters. Uh, they sound different. They orient to the world differently. And so I love this insight that maybe some of that, you know, you know, every, every person is different. Every kid in, in every family is different, right? But but at least some yeah. of this, uh, as, as you pointed to, even Lehi points to, to, to some of Jacob's personality may well have been shaped because of these circumstances that, that, that he was born into, the, 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 the development that he went through. So, so let's think about it. We'll, we'll come back to Jacob, but, but let's think about it for a minute from the, the kind of parents' uh, mm -hmm. uh, standpoint, right? So I think about these, these parents that you've worked with. You know, nobody chooses to be a refugee. Nobody chooses to be you know, driven from their homes and take their kids away from, from safety and security. Um, you know, just just the fact of the world that we live in is that uh, uh, most children, you know, maybe all children don't have optimal parents. I, I, I don't know that there's <laughs> yeah. ever been uh, perfect parents, right? Uh, my, my, my kids can swear testimonials uh, to, to, to that. So, yeah. so e even parents who are trying their best, right, to protect their kids, to provide for their kids, there are just going to be areas um, you know, where, where kids are, are vulnerable and, and, and sometimes get, get hurt. And so, 
So I think for parents that can lead to a lot, a sense of, of guilt. It, it can set, uh, lead to a sense of, yeah. um, of, of taking on that kind of responsibility. Am, am, am I responsible for, for these things that, that, that have happened to, to my kids where I can see uh, that, uh, that there have been harms done? So, so how do we think about that as parents? And in particular, especially if you're maybe right still in the middle of it, um, is repair possible? Is, is, is it possible to come back and, and, and address some of those suboptimal both conditions, but also maybe behaviors uh, as, as parents. Yeah, and I think you're totally right. That's almost the very next thing that comes up every time we I teach this or every time we work with parents. Um, and so first I'd say, welcome to the club. Welcome to parents. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, our mistakes are gonna happen. And um, and I and I think you're right. I, I actually think, um, you know, having optimal parents might not even be very preferred. That might not be actually optimal because I think also those relationship mistakes serve a really good purpose too. And they build adaptability and nuance, um, understanding more about what it is to be human. So, you know, in addition to being adaptable, this kind of attachment system is also des designed to thrive at sort of good enough levels and to be really open to improvement. Um, and the other piece is, uh, or related, is um, I think very reassuringly, we also know that there is great strength in repair, big and small. Um, as you said, no parents are attuned to their needs all the time. And um, research shows that it is the moments of repair, of reconnection, of coming back, that further strength and connection and the capacity for relationships um, and ultimately experiencing inner peace. If we had this rigid belief, you know, that our parents gave us that everyone's going to be always perfect with us all the time, we would not be very good in other relationships because we, we would be, we would have that model of like, everyone does exactly what I need at every moment. But instead, um, you know, it's part of the whole design that we experience disattunement and disconnection and mistake, and then have the opportunity for repair. And as that happens, it's like the, this operating manual in our head kind of recalibrates to say, even when things don't go as planned, there's hope for repair. Um, and so, you know, as, as parents, uh, it's not the avoidance or the kind of trying to, to make sure there's no mistakes made, but it's perhaps focusing on that reconnection and um, connecting our children in, uh, with ourselves and with other people and with things that will bring them that kind of repair um, and ultimately that inner peace. So and, and, I think, and maybe that's exactly what, what, what Lehi's doing with Jacob, right? And in, 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 yeah. in that sermon is, is, uh, is he, he's talking about repair. He's, as, as you said, he's talking about redemption. Right? How how do we take these? He's talking about opposition, right? All, all of these kinds of things. He, he's not turning a blind eye to it. He, he recognizes yeah. that that is a a feature, not a bug, uh, in 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 Jacob's experience. But that 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 he can't just wallow in the, the the hardship, the opposition. That all of that becomes a kind of platform. But he has to have something to look forward to. He has to, he has to have something to hold on to. And, and of course, Lehi, Lehi is presenting to him the Messiah and, and hope in, in, in a repair. You know, you can't go back to Jerusalem sometimes. There's, there's no going back. That yeah. ship has sailed, literally. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but, but what does it look like given the, the circumstances and environment you have? Is, 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 that, is that about right? Is that the, the kind of orientation here? Uh, yeah, absolutely. That it is sort of in that very act of um, of having um, a fracture or of not meeting expectations or of um, not being perfect. And then that repair that um, builds the confidence. And I, and I also just can't help but think about like the principle of repentance and how that is a turning back. And so it's that same sort of turning back to each other and figuring out, you know, where we are, how we can, um, how we can find sort of that place of, um, of sort of balance and uh, restoration in, in the relationship. And, you know, I, I'll pull in another 
piece of scripture, story from scripture, because I also often think about the prodigal son in this way, because I think, um, you know, there's a bunch of repair happening in that as well. And, you know, the prodigal son, or he has two sons, Christ never names which one is actually the prodigal, but, um, mm -hmm. you know, the younger son had struggled with physical temptations and appetites, and he was returning, and he didn't need a lecture. He needed reassurance, comfort. He needed that secure base. Um, he was coming back from being too far away on that pendulum and needed to be closer to home. And then the second son was kind of in this comfort close by place. And he struggled not with his physical appetites, but with kind of secondary temptations and choices, like how we feel relative to fairness and other people and, and what other people's decisions have done. And so he needed some gentle chiving to move, move him out from his kind of comfort zone into some growth um, to kind of change his beliefs. And I think what's really beautiful is, you know, the father sensed this in each son, um, there was probably some repair that needed to be done between all three of them. But um, I think that in our lives, we're all three. We um, both seek and give repair in our relationships. And this never ending cycle gives us insight and compassion. Um, so we learn how to love each other and access grace in allowing ourselves and others to mess up and repair. So Annie, I'm just struck in all of this about how much we can learn from Lehi and learn from the scriptures about parenting. And it's it's very counterintuitive to the way we think about parenting today from a helicopter perspective, right? Where we are just hovering over our children, trying to do everything we possibly can to kind of buffer them from a fallen world. And in fact, we know that basically the plan of salvation involves our heavenly parents just sort of dropping us off on a street corner and being like, <laughs> go make good choices, you know, and, um, <laughs> yeah. and, and certainly, but, but always, always inviting us back. And one of the things that I love about this is that clearly what I hear you telling me both on a temporal, a personal relationship, also on a spiritual relationship, that, that the strength comes when we return and try to repair those relationships. That it, it isn't just in being adjacent to someone, but we have to have gone through the process of kind of moving out and then recognizing the need, coming back in and repairing the relationship. And, and then the relationship is so much stronger than it would have been if we hadn't somehow left. Right. And, mm -hmm. and so that seems to me very much the plan of salvation is that this it's this requirement that we move out into difficulty and then constantly go through that cycle of coming back to you know over and over again until hopefully we arrive at the point of perfect repair and perfect return because we've been mm -hmm. through that process and we kind of understand one another so mm -hmm. um so i don't know do you have anything to add to that or we can go to our next question it was more yeah, a statement than I, a question no that's that's fine i you know i do i i love finding sort of these patterns nested, you know, yeah. in our human design, in our, what we know about the gospel in, um, and I, and it does show up over and over again. And I think it kind of goes back to my definition of peace as sort of an equilibrium. And so, you know, we balance these, these two tensions, one for comfort and safety and nurture and the other one for this exploration yeah. and trial. Um, again, like sent from our heavenly home to experience a world that is far, far away. Um, and I think that tension um, between these seemingly incompatible elements is actually, um, you know, a paradox that we are meant to experience. And that, um, you know, sometimes I even think that might be the straight and narrow way is that that sort of adjusting, um, balance between paradox, between comfort and challenge, safety and growth, justice and mercy. Um, you know, Lehi said, actually, I believe it was in that, that portion, that blessing to Jacob, you know, all things must needs be compound in one. And I think we hold those, those pieces. And so this pattern of family relationships um, is another example of a larger pattern as we develop. And like you said, there's the scattering and the gathering. There's the falling away and the restoration. There's pride and hum humility. And so sort of on that grand uh, doctrinal level, we see that. And I also think about that in our daily, you know, we pray um, 
which is sort of a secure base action, you know, a, a, an attachment habit with, with God. And then we get up and live our day and go about it. And then as needed, we can consult and then we come back again to the secure base. And so there's this constant sort of out and in, um, or even it just occurred to me, you know, the President Hinckley story about his trouble, you know, he's having trouble on his mission and he wrote home to his dad, which again, that's a very attachment, <laughs> you know, like I'm going to, I'm going to call my mom. I'm going to write to my dad and tell him, you know, like how hard things are. And, um, you know, his dad acknowledges it and says, I think the word, the phrase was get up off your knees and get to work. And so I think those two things, um, are, are where, sort of the best growth and, and, and relationship um, uh, alch alchemy is. So that, um, th these last few comments that you've made uh, leads, leads me to ask, uh, you know, you've, we've been talking a lot about child development and these kinds of principles of child development, but, but especially in, in that answer, you're thinking about uh, spiritual development for each of us. So where, where mm -hmm. do you see are, are there lessons that, that we can take from the, the world of, of child development uh, and, and apply to, to our lives more generally, more broadly, even, even as adults, in terms of spiritual development, the kinds of things that we do throughout our lives um, mm. as, as we encounter the world? Yeah, I think, um, you know, spiritual development is uh, similar to other sort of frames of development, physical, emotional, moral in that, um, according to Piaget and others, there's this cycle of order, disorder, and then reorder. So we think we know the world, you know, a kid says everything with four legs is a dog, and then they encounter a cat, and it rocks their world. Like, what? This, you know, this creature didn't say bow wow, it said meow, and then had to sort of there was disorder and confusion. It had to reorder their world. Like, okay, now my world also includes that there are other kinds. And I think, um, you know, that's a very, very basic um, example, but it's, you know, in the, in sort of the Piaget framework, it's exactly what happens cognitively. And I think the same thing happens spiritually. So it, you know, we're comfortable and then something pushes us into disorder. Um, and then we have to reorder. And I do think that's part of the plan. I think that's um, sort of that, you know, it parallels that pursuit of both a home sort of secure base and growth. Um, but as we do that, we um, we're in that zone, I guess, again, that we're that I'm talking that I am thinking of when I think of peace, which is something drawing us forward. There's direction, there's meaning and there's connection. Um, and so I, I think also what's really beautiful is, um, you know, I often think about people who didn't have parents, you know, as adults, they're looking back and feeling like I didn't have the parent I needed. Um, I think another beautiful principle is that, um, in fact, our heavenly parents know perfectly how to parent or reparent us in the ways that we need in order to seek and establish peace. Um, and I think that's, again, not to sort of belabor the point, but again, sometimes that what's needed might be a challenge or um, you know, the world having its work on you in sort of encouraging growth. Um, but sometimes it is what is needed is that secure, loving, uh, rest in coming into Christ. And I, uh, I think that, you know, going back to Jacob, he cultivates and experiences that connective relationship with God that helps heal him too. Um, I think he finds that, um, with God. So I was so struck just as you were talking about the fact that, you know, we don't know what Jacob's relationship was with Lehi. It's, we assume it was quite close, um, but we also know that this is a family that was fairly fractured. But it strikes me that this is Lehi's final blessing to Jacob. And whether it sounds like Jacob was fairly attached to Lehi, they had a close relationship. You know, Lehi could give, transmit to him some knowledge that he thought was important for Jacob to have. But we also know that Lehi's leaving. And Lisa, Lehi clearly knows that he's leaving, right? He's dying. Mm -hmm. And what's so interesting to me that in that situation, he transfers, he tries to reinforce the transfer of the attachment for Jacob to something beyond him, to God, 
to, you know, to Christ who's able to kind of help him. And, and so I'm wondering if you can kind of share with us what you think it looks like to have in this kind of fallen world, in these difficult situations um, in which we find ourselves, you know, going through this process of order, disorder, and reorder, how we can develop a secure attachment relationship with God and how we can foster that in our children. Because it seems to me that that's mm -hmm. one of the best gifts that we can give them. We know that to some degree we're going to fail them, even if it just means that at some point we're going to leave. Um, and, and so it seems like it's very important for us to help them develop this bigger attachment relationship to God as they go on this spiritual journey. And I'm just wondering mm -hmm. if you'd kind of share your thoughts about that with us. Mm, that's such a good question. Um, and, and I also, before I answer that, I also have in mind that a lot of times people's concept of God is built on their concept of their parent. And so sometimes mm -hmm. when you've had an experience of a loving father who sort of responded in ways that you needed, it's maybe easy to think about a loving heavenly father who also has that your attachment. best interests in mind. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so I, I do, you know, we do know from the research that, you know, having a, a good and secure attachment to someone um, increases your capacity to do that with others. Because again, you've got that working map in your mind about how relationships work. And so um, it's, I think um, in times where, um, so one way to help your children have an attachment relationship with God, of course, is to, um, is to model that and to also, um, to introduce them to a loving pattern of response and forgiveness, um, and repentance. But absent that, um, I think what's so, um, you know, as I was referring to earlier, I feel like heavenly father, our heavenly parents know what we need. And so, um, as parents, we are also given that sort of divine connection. We can be like Lehi and even having not been able to give our children, maybe at the time what they needed or what you hoped to have been available or to buffer in ways that you hoped to, um, we still have access to, through that stewardship to, um, the influence of the spirit and to knowing, um, how best to, to sucker. And in that way, it refines us too, as people, um, we come to know a little bit more closely what it is to, um, to learn the healer's art, to be, um, to sacrifice, um, and to be humble, to really, you know, sort of, I think some of my most humbling times have been as a parent where I realized I was completely wrong and wish I had done it differently and can't go back now, but I can own that now and, um, and move forward, um, you know, with that identification and, and sort of that pure, uh, sort of candid, um, desire to repair. Um, so I think that's probably, that's um, yeah. Yeah. So let's 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 come back to Jacob uh, for a moment, and uh, we we see him especially in the book of Jacob. He's he's become a leader of the community. He's he's a priest. He's he's teaching the people. He has clear moral authority that's that's been given to him uh, from from Nephi. How as you read these texts, how do, how do you think that Jacob's difficult experiences that he had uh, as a young man? Uh, gave him the temperament and otherwise helped prepare him to be an effective leader, that, that the kind of leader that, that the Nephites needed. Yeah, I, I found this to be so moving. And again, I think I just felt like I became acquainted with Jacob in that way um, where he felt 3D, like he had very real struggles mm. um, that we kind of inferred and read about. And again, uh, don't know a lot of the details, but using some of the uh, what we know about relationships and, um, you know, what I found in the, in his leadership was, um, that he was able to identify what his people needed. So he sort of uses his superpower, which was born in the wilderness. And it was almost maybe a hyper attunement 
for vigilance. You know, in in those early chapters of Jacob, he says over and over, I started marking all of these sort of, um, you know, his own indication of his, you know, faith and anxiety, his um, take it upon me to fulfill the commandment of my brother. He takes everything very seriously and very, you know, um, he feels it heavily. Personally. And he's, yeah. He wants to do the right thing. And it, sometimes it feels like he's white knuckling it almost. And, um, and yet... I think that it was this very kind of attunement, which he developed. I would, I would, you know, maybe suggest in the wilderness, you know, watching sort of some moody interchanges with his brothers and needing to kind of get the emotional weather all the time. Um, he's able to discern. So add to that his very clear testimony and closeness with, with God. Um, he's able to discern the needs in really interesting ways. I think he notes, um, that he, it was I this is the first time I noticed that he basically says you're doing great but I can tell your thoughts and you're beginning to labor and sin and I don't know how often a prophet does that I mean quite often right they have some they have some um insights into you know into a people but he wasn't even saying you are have been doing these bad things he said I can tell it was in Jacob 2 verse 4 and 5 um, I can tell concerning your thoughts how you're beginning to labor in sin. Um, and so he, because of his experience, perhaps, of needing to adapt, you know, and use, he uses his anxiety basically for um, this attunement. And he's been able through this calibration to understand um, what's happening. And also he doesn't want to be the bad cop here. He's, you know, he's having to deliver, deliver a message about pride and chastity that he doesn't want to deliver here in um, Jacob 2, but he does it. And his um, message sort of echoes Lehi's to him, I think, which is, you know, weaknesses can become strong. Grace makes it possible. Being reconciled is important through the atonement. And so he always provides that sort of that way back and that repair message, um, which I think he has himself drawn on. Um, so I love that. I love seeing sort of hit him rise to the occasion in his very particular personality and, and very Jacob way. Um, so I love this idea that, that this anxiety that is sort of part of his temperament allows Jacob to kind of see around corners and it gives him the opportunity to, to sort of see things that are happening in his community that other people might be complacent about if their baseline is a lot less anxious. If these are people, you know, <laughs> we assume that the, the children that have come after have been raised in somewhat, some more stability than Jacob, right? They are in the promised land. They're building a community. We, we have record right up front that they've begun to prosper, that they, you know, have set up this very thriving community. So, so they're coming at the world very differently than Jacob did. And I love this insight that you have that because of the struggles that Jacob went through as a child, he was in a better place to kind of see um, problems arising because he had this heightened attunement. Um, mm. and, and one of the things that I, I loved about this as I was thinking about it was this idea that I have this tendency to have a pretty significant reverence for people who have committed great sin and have pivoted their lives and um, have this ability to kind of draw on the atonement in ways that that those who don't can't. Like if you have truly drawn on the atonement because you have made so many deep errors in your life, those people tend to have an incredible witness of of Christ and the power of of you know cleansing and mm -hmm. healing. But one of the things that your reading of Jacob has led me to, to realize is just this profound witness of this promise that we have in Alma 7, that, that Christ is also there for us in all of our extremities. And, and I think that Jacob's extremities, this, you know, this call that came from Lehi, Jacob heeded. He said, listen, I, you know, your way forward out of this anxiety, out of this trauma is Christ. And Jacob did that. And it seems that he comes out of this with a robust testimony of Christ's power to heal that is as robust as the testimonies that come from people who have sinned. And that was just such mm -hmm. a lovely um, idea to me that, um, that 
we can come to this very profound witness of the healing power of the atonement in different ways. And that Christ meets us where we're broken and he heals us mm. where we're broken. And to me, it was very, very much a witness to this concept that you have of repair, that it is whatever it is about us that is broken. It's going to be different for different people. But if we take it to the Savior, if we lay it before him, if we return to him, if we try to attach to him, that that repair takes place and can make us just extraordinarily strong. So this was just one of the things I loved about your reading of Jacob, because I just think, oh, Jacob was just this masterful human that, who managed to figure out to have this glorious you know, vision of the atonement and of the Savior. And, and I realized, no, no, Jacob paid for this, right? He didn't just pay for it um, probably in um, study and prayer, which I'm sure he did, but he paid for it through suffering. And um, that was just kind of a beautiful mm. idea to me that, you know, there is the repair is so possible and that Jacob is kind of a glorious example of that repair. Yeah. And I, I love that it's in Jacob seven, I believe, um, you know, after he has that um, uh, exchange, let's see, after he has the exchange with um, Sharam mm. and, and Sharam, like speaking of somebody who sort of has to come to grips with, with some things he's doing mm -hmm. wrong, but it came to pass that peace and the love of God was restored. And even then Jacob was still, you know, as he, his last words are sort of melancholy and like, well, it passes though it were a dream. Um, and later his son uh, does sort of, Enos speaks up to say, um, you know, my father was a just man and he's taught me in the language and in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and blessed be the name of my God for it. And so I, you know, I think another takeaway is we don't always know the impact that we're having as we're very real and using our own strengths and weaknesses. Um, we don't know the impact that we're making always, and that's okay. Um, and I think to your point about the ability to sort of adapt and grow and access, um, even in the face of imperfect people, imperfect qualities in ourselves, imperfect circumstances. Um, I really love the Martin Luther quote, uh, Martin Luther King quote that is, um, the arc of history is long and bends toward justice. And I think I often revise that in my head with apologies to Martin Luther King. Um, and that is that I've come to believe that the arc of eternity is long and it bends toward development facilitated by grace. And so what I love about this Jacob story is it really um, it really articulates some of the things that I've noticed as I've studied uh, in my work and as a believing member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints that um, our human systems, emotional, physical, cognitive, relational, all operate with this um, built-in level of grace for imperfect circumstances and people. Um, and at the same time with this sort of inherent setting towards growth and healing and connection that perfectly echoes that doctrine of Christ, the Book of Mormon echoes. So um, that's where it kind of comes together for me. That's that's terrific. And, and I love the way the uh, sort of ended that. And, and uh, as, as we reflect on on peace and going back to your earlier, earlier definition that that um, Sometimes there can be the sense that that peace is is the 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 point at which we're sort of beyond struggle. Uh, it's it's some kind of destination on or past the horizon, and and I I think what what you've helped us understand you know through your reading of of these texts and and through all of your your research and and work over the years is to realize that actually peace can be found in and through the process. The, that uh, the human development is its own kind of of peace uh, that, that that can come uh, that it's that it's about growth that's about uh, kind of having having an orientation towards some of those uh, challenges that, that that we might face rather than just like I have to get through this so that I can achieve peace at some vague point uh, in the mm. future so I think that's really useful so. So as, as we wrap up, uh, we just want to give you the, the, the chance to offer any other thoughts, but, but, but especially we, we'd love to hear you reflect uh, on where you personally find peace in your life. Hmm. Um, 
So I personally find peace often, again, like it's going to be very consistent with what I've said already, but I find peace in a place where I can use myself, but know where I'm going. And so that's sort of, um, it's not, I kind of think about what peace isn't. So when I am restless because I am not sure what to do, um, the way I find peace or restore peace is coming back to who I am and what the meaning is. So ultimately the gospel of Jesus Christ, but, but in a very like pragmatic way, it's, um, it's recalibrating sort of where I am and where I'm going. So it can, I can find it anywhere. Um, as long as I kind of have those, those things in mind. Well, I love that idea, Annie, of peace is not something static, but forward motion, right? That it's us moving forward with a sense of who we are um, towards kind of what God would have us do. And I think that is a source of extraordinary peace. So thank you. Thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate you sharing your insights with us. They've been magnificent. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Hope for Thanks parents and children everywhere. There is a system <laughs> built for our success. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for watching today. Uh, we just want to remind you, as always, to subscribe to the podcast, to rate and review us. Uh, we love hearing feedback from people, so please leave feedback. Uh, you can email us at podcast at mweg.org. And uh, we also want to invite you to think about ways that you can make peace in your life this week. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next time.